Okay, so I'm going to close out discussing uh, the legal liability issues. Um, and uh, I just want to reiterate uh, a lot of the technical uncertainties that we've been hearing about are clearly important to assessing the potential liabilities in this case. And uh, a case of this magnitude is going to be litigated very heavily. Um, and that even raises the uncertainties uh, more because lawyers, businesses have a great deal of incentive to come up with creative uh, arguments uh, either to assert liability or to limit it. Um, so I'm going to sort of follow through the basic framework that I started out with, talking about who is potentially responsible here, uh, talking about the different types of liability, and then talking about the liability limits, which is, I mentioned at the beginning, a key issue that's been de debated in Congress, at least with respect to the Oil Pollution uh, Act itself. So let me start out with the responsible parties. Uh, we've got British Petro Petroleum, Transocean, I think I said transuranic and outed myself as a, as a former chemist. Um, and then Halliburton are the three major players here. And I want to draw a clear line uh, between British Petroleum, BP, um, and Transocean and Halliburton because those two kind of subclasses of entities uh, or potentially responsible parties are treated differently, particularly under the Oil Pollution Act, which is a key player uh, in the issues with regard to uh, uh, liability in this case. Maybe we don't have the sorts of complexity that you, you see uh, uh, from a technical standpoint, but one of the things that makes this area of the law interesting and challenging to deal with is that we actually have multiple layers of law at stake here, and I've tried to illustrate that here. So at the federal level, we have the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. We also have under Admiralty Law, the Ship Owners Limitation and Liability Act of 1851. Um, and I'm not going to actually spend very much time talking about the Admiralty issues. And the primary reason for that is that when the Oil Pollution Act was passed in 1990, um, it significantly limited the application of the liability caps that exist under the Limitations Act of uh, 1851. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail, but what I want you to understand from this is that the Oil Pollution Act largely sort of determines liability in this case at the federal level for purposes, again, of liability and also with regard to financial requirements. Uh, the Oil Pollution Act operated or was passed in the shadow of uh, the Exxon Valdez spill. Remember, the Exxon Valdez spill occurred in 1989. The act was passed in 1990. But legislation in this area had actually been around for more than 15 years. And there was a split between the House and the Senate, particularly with respect to whether states would be permitted to establish independent bases for liability for oil spills. The House wanted the Oil Pollution Act to preempt state laws and basically say it determines the full scope of liability for uh, um, an oil spill, uh, whereas the Senate was interested in protecting the unique state interests in protecting their lands and their people under the police power. Um, and with the Exxon Valdez spill, it sort of tipped the balance in favor of the Senate. So we exist in a world where we have concurrent forms or sources of liability at the federal level, predominantly under the Oil Pollution Act, but also at the state level. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. So at the state level, we have distinct statutes that establish strict liability for oil pollution spills. Uh, and we also have common law. So you can sort of think about it. What's the liability under the Oil Pollution Act at the federal level? What's additional liability under state statutes? And further liability under state common law actions. So those are the, four, the three basic sources of liability that exist in this case. So we've got three responsible parties. We've got three basic sources of liability. And what I'm going to do is walk through these different sources of liability by first starting with BP and looking at the Oil Pollution Act and then looking at three states. Um, and I'll see if I get this to work. So this is just uh, a recent graphic taken from the New York Times uh, that illustrates uh, where the current plume or oil is. And we see four states predominantly. Texas could be impacted as well, but four predominant states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, 
uh, the sort of key states with regard to the impacts of the oil spill, at least as it looks right now. And so when you have this domain, this legal domain, where you have federal law that's creating liability and you have state law that's creating liability, you not only have to look at the federal law, you have to look at the distinct laws that exist in each of the states that are implicated um, at this time. And that's basically what I'm going to do to sort of play out and describe the potential sources of liability in this case. Okay, so British Petroleum, we start off with the Oil Pollution Act. Uh, it is liable for cleanup costs and that liability uh, is unlimited. One of the interesting things about the Oil Pollution Act, at least with regard to offshore oil rigs like the one in this particular case, is the responsible parties under the statute are parties that hold a lease, in this case from the, minimal, min the Mineral Management uh, Service of the federal government. That's the sort of trigger for whether you have liability under the Oil Pollution Act. The only entity that holds a lease in this case although there, there are other interests, I think, that have some portion of uh, interest in the development here. But the key one here is BP. It's not Transocean. It's not Halliburton. So BP comes in under the OPA. And in fact, the US Coast Guard has identified BP alone as the responsible party in this case. So they've got unlimited liability for the cleanup costs under the OPA. That's federal. So wherever cleanup is occurring, they've got that liability. Uh, there's also this $75 million in damages uh, that comes along with this. So this isn't just the cleanup. This is uh, natural resource damages. So if the integrity of the ecosystem, as Chip Grout was talking about, is seriously hampered in the short term or the long term, there can be significant natural resource damages. If we think back to, to the Exxon Valdez, there were about $900 million in natural resource damages associated with that spill. So this is a non-trivial component uh, of uh, the risk here. Uh, and then you have all the economic losses that for the communities in Louisiana uh, in particular are going to be really important here. The catch, of course, is that it caps out at $75 million. And though Congress attempted retroactively to change that, so they so far haven't succeeded in doing that. This is sort of a classic example of in the law where we're trying to balance competing interests. We want to promote oil development. Uh, we want to ensure that it is done safely. Uh, and so we want to impose liability, but we want to contain it in a way because at a certain point, unlimited liability can become a, a significant barrier to development in a particular area. You can disagree about whether Congress has struck the right balance here, this combination of cleanup liability, cap damages liability, and then a tax that creates a separate fund for cleanup actions. Uh, but that's the basic sort of balance that's being attempted to be struck in this particular case. So that's the OPA. That applies specifically to BP. And that looks, you know, from a legal perspective, relatively clear. Uh, Louisiana largely uh, uh, models its statute. So we have a separate state statute that creates strict liability for an oil spill uh, off of the Oil Pollution Act. So unlimited cleanup liability plus a separate $75 million cap for damages that's also uh, uh, set relatively uh, uh, broadly in terms of the range of damages that are covered here. Uh, so we see sort of a direct parallel between the federal statute and the state statute in Louisiana. The other interesting thing about the state statute is that it cuts off that separate source of liability under state common law. There's this exclusive provision in the statute that says if this statute applies, uh, no other liability can be obtained under other, any other state laws. Uh, so in Louisiana, the cap at the federal level and the cap at the state level is really, really important with regard to damages. It's going to be cleaned up. But there's a significant limitation, at least as it looks right now, with regard to the damages that the collective damages that uh, folks in Louisiana uh, or people who file suits in Louisiana or under Louisiana law are going to be held to. OK, so federal government, Louisiana. I'm going to look and talk very briefly about Florida and Alabama as representative cases, again, just to illustrate some of the basic differences. Uh, so in Florida, you have a pollution discharge law. There's strict liability for cleanup costs, but it's capped in this case. 
So at the federal level in Louisiana, we have unlimited uh, liability for cleanup. Florida sort of cut the difference a little bit, but it has unlimited liability for natural resource damages. Clearly, they may be passing their statute uh, uh, knowing about the OPA, and they're sort of adding in this additional unlimited liability with regard to natural resource damages. There are lots of highly valuable natural resources in uh, Florida. Uh, and then, unlike Louisiana, common law remedies like negligence uh, can apply in this case. So if I'm looking at someone who's claiming harm in Florida, and they're going after BP, they can come in under the federal law, they can come in under a state statutory law, and they can also bring an action under common law. Finally, if we look at Alabama, uh, the big difference here, and this is the one thing I'll focus on with regard to Alabama, is that the state statute in this case has a different standard for establishing liability. The federal statute, the Louisiana statute, and the Florida statute are all strict liability. If there's a spill and you come in as a responsible party, you're automatically, automatically liable for the various types of liability that exist under the statute. In Alabama, you have to demonstrate that the party was negligent. And what we've heard already is that establishing negligence uh, is at the very least complicated and uncertain at this point. And then one last final point is, under both Florida and Alabama, there's a possibility for punitive damages. And if you think about the Exxon Valdez skill, spill, one of the key issues there was punitive damages. Now, it's a very different set of circumstances in this case. In Exxon Valdez, you had a drunken captain running a massive oil tanker. We don't have any evidence of that in this particular case. But there's sort of growing concern that maybe BP was trying to push development faster than it ought to have. Um, so there's at least a potential for punitive damages um, in Florida uh, and Alabama. There are no punitive damages um, uh, provided for in uh, Louisiana. Okay, three minutes. So to sum up, um, one of the things that the existing system that we have, this sort of mixture of sources of liability at the federal level and the state level does, is give plaintiffs multiple opportunities or multiple bases for getting liability or establishing liability uh, against the, the different parties. And actually, did I skip? I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll stop. I'll back up for one second really quickly. Uh, and so if you're looking at unlimited cleanup liability, you can find that under the Oil Pollution Act in Mississippi and Louisiana. Unlimited natural resource damages exist in Florida. Unlimited compensatory damages, assuming you can establish negligence, uh, exist in Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama. Capped punitive damages uh, exist in Florida, Mississippi, um, and Alabama. I haven't talked about um, Transocean and Halliburton. The big difference there, again, is Halliburton and Transocean come under the state statutes and potentially come under the state common law as well. And so there's sort of parallels there if you want, if, if plaintiffs want to try to uh, uh, establish liability uh, for them as well. One of the things that I've read, though, from a contractual basis, uh, is that in many cases, uh, the relationship between the oil company and uh, the drilling company is that uh, the oil company basically uh, agrees to pay any sorts of potential liability uh, that may be established against the drilling company. So it may be as a practical matter you can establish liability against Transocean. Uh, but it may be the case, which seems to be the industry norm, that EP is ultimately going to be responsible for it. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to your questions.